Uh, good. Uh, and uh, they've been looking forward because all they know that is I'm coming to Florida. And all that they know about Florida is Mickey Mouse and the rest of the world. So they're not happy that I'm in retreat in Florida. It's not their fault half of my church think the same thing as well. Because I said, I'm going to retreat Florida. Ooh, Florida, nice. Where? I said, uh, this is somewhere. Anywhere in Florida is fine, Pastor. It's a sunshine state. And you all say, amen. <laughs> well, uh, I said, no, it's, this is far from Orlando. This is somewhere in Gainesville. Great. Is that by the beach? I said, I don't know. I don't think so. It's in a hotel. That's fine. There are beach, hotels by beaches. It'll be great. Uh, enjoy the view, Pastor. That's how they send me. So right when I got to the room, I took the picture of South Parking and, <laughs> and sent them, this is my view, just in case y'all are still praying. You know, y'all can tone down your prayer requests. You know. Uh, so uh, it's, it's good to be here. I just want to get you guys on a Friday night. It's, it's, it's hard, but just like Pastor said, that's the whole purpose behind. We are here to retreat, retreat from our daily life, retreat from our daily planning, retreat from, from all the things that we've been doing on a routine manner and take a break. Now take a break in retreat is not just to relax and be idle and, and not doing anything. Uh, we are children of God. So in that process to retrain our mind, retrain our spirit so that when we go back in this body, because nothing's going to happen to this body, just, just letting you know. There's no plastic surgery, there's no reformation to this body. You're going to go exactly back with the two hands and two legs and what all you had. You're going to go back. But what you're going to renew is your spirit and what is in yourself. So you go back, so renewing your mind, so you're not thinking in that same old fashion. You're not functioning in the same old way. So you take a retreat from all that. So there is a purpose, not just sitting back and, and just putting your leg over the other and just relaxing, but with the purpose of retreating from your regular life to something new so that you can go back because you're not running away, right? Uh, this, this is not it. We got to go back to whatever your real bubble is all about and go back to function in a newer person, in a newer person, not the same old person, but renewed in that manner. So uh, Pastor and Alexander Uncle gave me the option to think, hey, you're welcome to share uh, if you want to put a theme. And this is what Lord laid in my heart, which has been something that has been ringing throughout the year based off of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the last word. So what we're going to do for the next three days is we're going to based on that, three aspects, and we'll focus on that one tonight, the second one tomorrow night, and then we'll close off Sunday morning. So uh, if, if you're there with me, read, uh, help me out with 1 Corinthians 15. We'll read 57 and 58 and uh, focus on one aspect of 58 today, which is about standing. Uh, if you're there with me, you can say amen. amen. The rest are getting there. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 50. Any volunteers? Thank you, Auntie. Yeah. Ningal ora pulla varum. Kulungatha varum. Eppozhum vardhichu veruga. Ora pulla varum. Kulungatha varum. Eppozhum kartavinte velayil prayatnathil Pravartil Vartiche Verga. In in English, first uh, Corinthians 15, 15, 57, 15, anybody? Up in the front? I know you're looking in the Bibles. What's that? Be steadfast. Now say that. Be steadfast. Immovable. And always abounding in works. So today we're going to focus on being steadfast. Now that's not a you word you usually use in your daily language. Hey, how's your life? Is it steadfast, bro? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, we, we, we barely use that word, steadfast. It has nothing to do about walking fast. It has nothing to do about studying. It's just an archaic English term that we rarely use, steadfast. In other words, it's more dealing on to be firm, to stand firm. And that's where we get the theme in what we are focusing the next three days. So we're going we're gonna to learn together. We're going to interact together. So I need support. The first day, I won't put a lot of work on you guys. But in the coming days, I would 
need some interaction. I might need the volunteers as well. We're still just getting to know y'all, so I'm not going to call out y'all right now. Okay? Y'all are so tight, bro. Okay. I just say y'all because that's, we're from Texas. Right. Okay. Uh, standing firm. I don't think we need an analogy to talk about standing firm. Standing firm, having a ground of your own. In terms, sometimes you say, hey, are you grounded? Are you firm? That doesn't mean you don't move around because we'll talk about immovable tomorrow, God willing. Standing firm, having ground, you're having a rooted base holding yourself. Uh, the scripture talks about several aspects about standing. We won't talk on all angles, but sometimes uh, this retreat is so helpful for us to uh, realign our notions. Sometimes we've been doing the same old thing for a long time, and that is all we know. And this whole chapter, Paul focuses on what you know. Therefore, now that you know, and then he ends this. And we will talk about the history and the context and all that later on, so you can come into the same page where I'm leading. But sometimes we get so used with the the routine you know the, the, there was a story where a young girl eight and nine year old I know we are coming pretty close to Thanksgiving season so this young girl looked at a mom who was uh, getting uh, the ham ready and she would take the ham and chop off both the ends so this big of a ham she'll just chop it off almost two-third of it's gone and there's a small piece of ham in this big tray and, uh, and it's in the oven so this eight nine year old asked uh, this mom Mom, why are you chopping those? Aren't they not good? Or you're not supposed to eat it? Or there's something bad about it? Or what is the secret behind it? The mom thought, hmm, good question. Uh, why am I chopping that off? I don't know. That's how, I, that's how my mom did it. You want to go ask uh, grandma? Okay. So grandma lived in the same home. So the nine-year-old girl went and asked, asked the grandma, 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 why does mommy put ham chopping off both the ends? She said, that's how you do it. Do you know why you do that? Oh, well, that's how my mom did it. Can you go ask her? So the great-grandma in her 90s was still alive living by herself. This eight, nine-year-old girl, when she got a chance, she went and visited great-grandma. And she asked, Mima, can you tell me why does my mom cook ham by chopping off two ends and putting it in such a big tray? And she said her mom, which is your daughter, did it that way. So I asked her and she told to come and ask you, do you know why? Oh, yes, yes, yes. You know, back in the day, we did not have such a big oven. So it was so small, so we couldn't fit a large ham. So we would chop up both ends, and that's how we cooked it. And my daughter saw it, and that's how they still did it. But they probably don't realize it's all because of the oven. It has nothing to do with the ham. It was supposed to be a little funny. <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you it was a joke, so you laugh at the end. My bad. But you get the point behind it. Sometimes you've been doing things generation by generation. You've been so used in the routine, in the mundane, defined by some parameters, defined by some written structures. Sometimes we say we don't have liturgy, but we are quite often develop our own style of liturgy, our own cliches that we use when we preach, when we come to the church. We have our own Christianese language. We know to talk the word when we come here, and then we go out in the world we have our own style of lingo and language, how you talk with each other, your friends, your colleagues, your co-workers, your, your, your home, your family. And when we come, we have our own structure and style of knowing we've been doing this for a while. So, so I'm hoping that after these three days, we will renew our lifestyle. We will renew the way we think. We will renew our cultural aspects in how we process daily living so we can be renewed in how we move forward. Amen? Can we do this together? All right. So standing firm, I want to take you based on that. So I'm not going to be so exegetical. We will try as much as we can. But topically speaking, today I want to focus on standing. I'll try a few words. I know there are aunties and uncles that would be helpful. I was also informed by one brother from our church saying, Pastor, I got a call from an amici asking, 
ഇദ്ദേഹത്തിന് മലയാളം വല്ലതും പറയാൻ അറിയാമോ എന്ന് ചോദിച്ചു സോ ഹീ സെറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് ഹീ നോസ് മലയാളം ബെറർ ദൻ ഹീ സോ ഐ സെറ്റ് ഐ വുഡ് ട്രൈ മൈ ബെസ്റ്റ് ബട്ട് ഐ വോണ്ട് മേക്ക് ഷുവർ ദാറ്റ് വി അഡ്രസ് എവറിബഡി ടുഗദർ ദിസ് ഈവനിങ് കുഴപ്പമില്ലല്ലോ റെഡി മണി മുണ്ടൊക്കെ കുഴപ്പമില്ല എല്ലാവരും കൂടെ ഉണ്ട് ഓക്കെ സോ I want to turn your attention to Ephesians chapter 6. So 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 58 will be a theme verse for the next three days. All right? So today we'll be studying on the armor of God when Paul talks to the people and an epistle written to Ephesus. And we know very well, we probably have heard many messages about the armor of God. So we're going to focus from verse 10 onwards tonight uh, and uh, learn this together. Amen? So Paul says finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil for a struggle is not against flesh and blood but against number 1 rulers against the powers against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places four aspects is who we battle with so therefore take up the full armor of god so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm again 14 starts off with stand firm three times Paul emphasizes the importance of standing firm why so that you recognize who are you battling with number 1 number 2 to understand your purpose and identity in where God has placed you number 2 number 3 to moving forward in life you need to first stand firm and then he talks about the armor of God so the purpose of the armor of God more than a battle it's about you standing firm are you with me We are so quick to talk about armor of God about a fight ahead of us but that fight is all about you who are standing firm. So if you're not firm where you're standing, your fight will have its own consequences. All right? So we're going to learn that with that perception in our mind. You know, there is one element in this armor called the sword. What's a sword? The word of God. We're so quick to battle with the sword. but we have come to a point we are a bunch of naked christians trying to battle with the sword because we are not wearing what we are supposed to wear spiritually but we are jumping all of us into the battle for it with the word there is power in the word amen the word of god is a double edged sword amen the word has life amen word can change lives amen in the beginning was word word was god word was with god so it's not a bunch of letters it is god it is the living word of god it has life it is christ himself all by all means but you want to put on christ in you to utilize christ through you so that christ may be glorified so we are all of a sudden all quick in putting christ through us but we don't have christ in us in the way so we are not standing firm that is why we don't see christ through us i don't know why it's not working because it's not working in here when it works in here it works in here amen so we're going to start what's the first one what's the first element in the armor that's not the armor never mind that's okay you with me right so the first armor is stand firm therefore having girded your loins with with truth somebody say truth truth we always say the truth right you just lie to me right now no i'm just kidding i'm just kidding we always try to say the truth but as humans in our flesh we get driven away distracted away whatever age you might be i was not calling him out including myself sometimes your flesh overtakes you for the gain for the benefit of something and you have to make the right choice do i say the truth or do i try to say something white lie like not like full lie like in a half lie you know you know what i mean oh i'm talking the wrong way in houston we have a problem of lying florida i guess we don't okay with me so gird your loins with truth these are some words again we're going back to some archaic terms we're on serious hey did you gird your pants today we don't say that loins it's not lion spelled a different way loins so you have to understand the context so this is not just about putting a belt quite often they talk about the belt of truth this is not literally a belt but it's so easy to teach this in a in a malayali context because uh, back in the day there is a art a martial art called kalari payat ariyavalo 
Kalari paite months lai lelen korpele. You have seen sometimes your uncles and your dads wearing kaili at home, right? So that's a brought down version. And and when kalari paite, how that that's a martial art in in in, in Kerala. How they tie themselves is they have a long clock. A long mund kind of style, and they wrap it around through their legs, bring it up, and tie it around. So it's not the first tie. You know how your dad or your apachan has the first tie. Your kaili, you know, you know, like you have no. I may have to spell out kaili. I don't know what the kaili spelling is. Is it K? I don't know. So they have the first ketta, and then they go round. So back in the day, it has more eastern context in Israel, in Jordan. You probably have seen a picture. Bible, how the Israelites, or back in the day, how they had this long dress down, right? It's not juba; it's like way longer than juba, but it's not like an anti's ninety or maxi. This is how the men wore too. It's like a long thing, right? You with me? So that's how they do their daily living. But when they are assigned to work, when there is something important or call to battle, or somebody is coming to attack your sheep, what they do is they gird themselves. So they take that same clock. Bend it around and tie it up hard. All right. So that's what you take. Gird your loins. In other words, you protect yourself and set yourself ready. How do you set yourself ready? In truth. Why is that so important? You can't step one foot forward without you establish yourself with what is true. If you start yourself in something that is false, every step that you take will be false. If you start yourself something false, every step you take from there on, even though you might think it's true, is false. So that is why it's so important as a Christian, we have to know what is true. Well, it's easy. What is true? Jesus. Well, how do you apply Jesus in your daily life in truth? It's not just about just saying the truth all the time. It's knowing the truth. It's living the truth, and believing the truth. Okay, it's knowing the truth, believing the truth, and living in the truth. So this is so important. When you gird yourself, you're protecting. You're setting your leg to be free. Until then, it's like a big juba, right? You can't run all of a sudden. So they're trying to get their self in motion. Hot, hot. I don't know why they say that word in football. Anybody know why they say hot, hot in football? That's another question. We can talk later. That's been doing for centuries. From right from the, now, they're celebrating 100 years of NFL. I've researched myself. Nobody knows why they say hot. I know I'm in Gator World, Tim Tebow land, and all. Y'all might know hot. That's a different topic. But but hot hot, you get ready. They don't hang around with like a fancy cloth. They have all set themselves. Now imagine back in the day to get themselves ready. They get their legs in motion. It's free. So there's no tuni covering their leg. It's free. They can run. They can move. They can change position. They can tackle. They can figure out what they want to do. They gird themselves so they hold it tight. So when they run, truth is still with them. I'm not going too vulnerable, but get with me. They have something on, but if their intention is to run forward with truth and they're not tied up properly, it's like having a loose pant, for the lack of another illustration. You have something covering yourself, but when you are called into a task, if you're not covered properly, now I'm going a little deeper in a spiritual perspective. We might know a whole bunch of truth, but when you are a moment like Joseph in Potiphar's house, when you are called to run and flee, as the Bible says, Second Timothy two verse twenty-two, flee from lust. So it won't hold you, as you see in James five sixteen. Resist the devil. Through those moments, for you to understand, you better be ready. How are you ready? But if you're scared, if your pants is going to fall, this is how you walk. I know it sounds funny, but in spiritual life, this is how many of us walk. Because I don't know, Pastor. I don't know what to do in this situation. We have not fed ourselves with truth. The most, one of the most important element in the spiritual armor is girding your loins with truth, because every single thing afterwards is based on this. Every single element in the spiritual armor is based on this. If you don't have your loins girded well, if you don't have truth around you. 
covering areas that has to be covered with truth not by false idea not by cultural notions not by what you see on your facebook not what you see on your feed your news feed not what the world says or what other people define what the word defines if you don't have your foundation there everything else whether it be righteousness whether it be faith whether it be salvation if it's not based on this truth there will be other teachings that will talk about salvation there'll be other beliefs that talk about righteousness there'll be other things that talk about what your faith is supposed to be and then you'll be confused in your faith all should be based on truth satyam nammude jeevathil yatharthamayi arnillengil baaki endokke chovadu vechalum satyathil adishtitham allengil satyathil adin adisthanam illengil baaki ella ketti panadu vekkunathu mithyalyo vyajamaya mattendo arivilla so it is so important for us to focus on let me move forward the second thing is the breastplate of okay so you you've seen these roman pictures and you know, there's a breastplate right it starts from your shoulder it hangs down here i wish i had a picture on this it uh, i was not sure how much of media we have here but you can always google it's it's uh, breastplate it holds on your shoulder and goes all the way down here and you know what it stands on hmm Yeah somebody got the message right there the breastplate has to hold on the girded loins which is the truth in other words if your loins are not girded well you can't really put on breastplate because it'll be so loose the moment you move the breastplate will move as well and you become open and vulnerable to the enemy so you start out by girding your loins first which helps you to stand firm and when you're firm in the truth how do you become firm in the truth daily understand this whole process process we are in a daily battle in a spiritual life in your daily life you need this truth every single day this is not just for memory verse once a year to get a few trophies those are all good i used to be mad at my parents for pushing me for that making me write it down in a book chalara chalara parara 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 padiki 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 and like for what sometimes i feel it's more for their fame and credit like we have a bunch of china ware you want more how greedy can you be mom this is so selfish and i used to get tired of it but today i look back i praise god for my mommy who used to push me because now when i am in struggle when i need when i need that word it is those words that they used to push me it is not bible school that brings back to me It is not my degree that hangs on the wall that refreshes me. It is the word of God when I was 8, when I was 9, when I was 12, when I was 14, when I was alone, when I needed to enter the God. The word of God is true yesterday, today and forever. So girl yourself in the truth and then put on the breastplate of righteousness. What is righteousness? Malayalam it says needy. Righteousness, what is true? So you can't put what is true if you don't know what is Oh somebody with me who said that Come on man you 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 you're my best what's your name Jonathan Jonathan So Jonathan just help me out you cannot wear true if you don't know what is true so therefore righteousness is absolutely based on your truth In other words world law system is not what defines truth they have their own way of assessing what is right and wrong but in a scriptural personal perspective for a spiritual person you have to understand what is righteousness in Christ okay tonight i'm not going to go too theological about teaching you about righteousness but we will address something of the gospel later on because i think it's very imperative every time you touch the word you have to address the gospel otherwise you take out Christ there is nothing in okay that's that's a whole different thing so put on your breastplate of righteousness you cover your entire thoracic body where your heart beats where the air breathes where is the central focus i know brain is said we'll talk about that as well you with me this evening are we getting too intellectual no good someone say yes it's, it's all fine we're all good it's friday night you cover yourself with righteousness you align yourself with what is right and what is wrong and how am i made right not because of what i do good is because of what christ did good for me on the cross of calvary 
No matter how many good things I do, that will never define my righteousness in Christ Jesus. Because I am always standing at the footsteps of what the devil tries to put on my forehead. All the way around, sin, shame, sin, shame, destined to hell, sin, shame, destined to eternal damnation. But he pulled me out because nothing I did could change my destiny. But what only changed me is what he did on the cross of Calvary. And that is why Paul says, that is your basis to stand firm. So you can fight all you want. Your battle is not against flesh or blood. Because even people out there have battled against flesh or blood. So this is not about a human being. There is a spiritual force. This might be in church. This might be outside church. But when you know what you're attacking, when you understand yourself with truth, you cover yourself in righteousness. That is not of how many years you have been a Pentecostal. That's not saying, how long you've been a member of IPC Orlando or wherever you come from it is saying that the moment I have Christ and the daily understanding and, and, and reflection and transformation in Christ Jesus is what renews me in what I live and therefore I am proud I boast in Christ Jesus because of the righteousness I have through him hallelujah that has to be strong on the truth every single day on the truth you walk in your workplace, you speak the truth. You wake up in the morning, you speak the truth. Before even you brush your teeth, if you can practice it, you feed yourself with some truth. Even if it's one verse, chew on it. God knows your breath stinks. Uh, just take it in a spiritual way, okay, don't. When you wake up, have a discipline because the moment you go too far, you forget. Then you get so busy with things. You got to get the kids ready. The kids need to get the books ready. The books need to get themselves ready in the bag. And everything is a process after that. And then you look back. My goodness, what a morning. I'll tell you what a morning is. Every morning is going to be what a morning. Every day is going to look like a Monday morning. But you can repeat Sunday. Every morning is going to be like a Monday morning. What day of the week it is? Monday. <laughs> TGIF, Monday. But you can repeat Sunday. You don't end Sunday there. You take it with you. You take the word. You take the experience you have with worshiping God. It's not the two songs we sing and end, hallelujah, let's say a word of prayer. You take that in your heart and, and, and live a lifestyle of worship. And you live in that truth and righteousness. Number three, we move forward. What's the third one? Help me out. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your shoes, your shoes, your shoes is called the preparation of gospel of peace. The shoe is not called gospel. The shoe is not called peace. There are different teachings about this. The shoe is called the preparation of the gospel of peace. You're not wearing gospel. You're wearing something that prepares you to share the gospel. You're not wearing peace. You're assuring yourself, preparing ahead of time. Preparing ahead of time to move forward. I'm covered with truth. I'm walking in the truth. I'm protecting myself in righteousness because devil always looks at you. Oh, you're a loser. Oh, you have raised your hand before. You're not going to go any further. I know the sin you did. I saw it the other day. You were just by yourself. You have been doing altar calls for the last 67 years, man. What are you doing? Those voices will always creep you. But when you address back in righteousness in Christ Jesus, I fail, but he picks me up. And then I move forward, not to fall again, but I'm in the flesh. If you're intentionally walking in sin, we will address that in a later aspect in this. So it's not going to be all this nice, lovey-dovey, hallelujah, we're going to have some hardcore stuff, okay? Is that okay? All right, all right. I have to say, that's, that's what I'm assigned to do, and I, I, can't, I can't disobey God. So work with me. There will, there will be places where I have to get some hardcore truth. All right? Okay, so, so as you move forward, before even you start your battle with any other hardcore things, sword, those real things that we like to find. Shoe. Put on your shoe. Cherry pitra. Pone nubay cherry pitra. 
പക്ഷെ മണ്ണിൽ ഓടിയുള്ള ശീല ഉള്ളതുകൊണ്ട് കാലങ്ങ് തഴമ്പിച്ചിരിക്കുക we have been doing the same old thing for so long now our feet are so callous i don't think i need shoes my legs are so trained in the us you wear even in the house and out the house so your legs are pretty soft back in the day in kerala your parents or i'll put it on much to know everywhere they walked they walked barefoot it would be a special event if they wore some cheripu forget about shoe anybody know back days i'm not back in the day i just heard it don't don't date me by saying what stories i say but here it talks about it's so important to keep your feet every place you step you can talk about christianity all your life you can speak about word all your life but if your step is not aligned in the right manner you ain't going anywhere you ain't moving anywhere it's like a statue stuck in one place trying to give you a word trying to give you a message you're not going anywhere the gospel is about go and preach the gospel so before even you go anywhere with the great commission your feet better be ready what's on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace i need to prepare myself to move forward because i got to know what i'm going for why do i have all this truth it's not just for me what is righteousness it's not just to let me know that i am saved there's a mandate that is upon me I'm not called with this responsibility just so that I can say I can go to heaven. That's the worst disaster that has happened to church. We have been bunch of a selfish Christians where I know that I'm saved, good enough. You are not saved because you can get to heaven. You are saved so you can tell others that can make you there with you. Otherwise you're losing the purpose that you're created for. Christ called us to be missional not just me my i myself thank god because somebody told us the gospel nobody here woke up one day oh i need jesus somebody invested the truth in you and the holy spirit opened your eyes and convicted you either your mom your dad your sunday school teacher your pastor your word somebody the radio a song somebody story something from the word pointed you to christ and hence you became a christian nobody woke up on one fine morning and if that is how you came into kingdom if that is how you realized who your life is then you are called to do the same thing to someone else that conviction is preparing you for the gospel of gospel of peace let me talk about shalom real quick before i go to the next one what is shalom shalom is not everything going okay the way you want the best picture i can tell you about shalom is when Jesus was on that boat with his disciples when there was a wave and storm you remember the story where Jesus is with a whole bunch of disciples and they're trying to calm the storm and what is Jesus doing seriously how am i going to worship a god like that who's sleeping when there's a storm oh you never thought that you should like mom why am i praying to a jesus who will be sleeping when there's a wave hmm come on oh uh, yeah say that huh And guess what they add another adjective as if on a he was sleeping as if on a huh I'm glad y'all don't know that part pillow yeah there was sleep comfort in bible too what's your sleep number jesus when the wave is going he's sleeping comfortably as if on a pillow so how does shalom work there Shalom is not about the wave coming down. Shalom is not the absence of a storm. Shalom is the presence of the prince of peace in your boat even when there is a storm. In other words, shalom is everything that has to happen in his will will happen. And it is your understanding that he is in this is what brings you shalom. That is why when you have a very difficult situation when Paul says in Philippians 4 7 and 8 the peace that which is beyond your understanding simple english if you can explain that peace then you did not really hit peace if you could explain that peace in the situation you really did not get it because you can't really explain that peace that passeth all understanding where is Paul writing this in chains in a dungeon with no light 
barely a candlelight. He is trying to write this with word of mouth, trying to get somebody else to write these letters. He's saying, do not be anxious. You're kidding me? You have a soldier standing right next to your body and your life is over. But in everything with supplication and thanksgiving, you're kidding me. You're going to say, thank you for all this? What a God you're serving, man. You've been traveling around, first missionary, second missionary trip, third missionary trip. You've been traveling crusade after crusades. And this is what you get, your end result. And you say, thanksgiving. And with all thanksgiving. Why? Because this is not about trying to comfort me. It is not about trying to give, build a comfort bubble for myself. Mission kingdom work is not about trying to find a bunch of blessings that I can say that I have a bunch on my, on, my, on, my, on my bank account. I have so much around me. This is about your spiritual inheritance for you to say that I am glad that I chose this path. I am glad that I call myself a Christian. I am glad that I follow Christ. The world does not support me. I might be a minority. People don't agree with my viewpoints. They always might ridicule me. I might be bullied for my faith, but I will stand firm because of what he did on the cross therefore I thank him more than being concerned and blaming and whining for my faith I am proud to be called a child of God hallelujah when you have that notion that peace people who are bullying you did not walk away the society just did not stop all of a sudden oh my goodness we have to stop making fun of Christians we have to open every door we can for them to expand the gospel whatever they say Jesus thing whatever it's only going to increase the persecution. The rejection is only going to rise up. That's what the word says. In the end, you will hear more of this. You will have more laws that stop church and Christians being Christians. In the midst of that, like Paul, whose life is almost end in the dark dungeon, where there's only darkness, he sees a ray of light, not in his real world, but in the spiritual world, he sees a ray of light. I'm asking, is there a generation that will stand up even when everything seems dark around them? Will they see a ray of light and say that I experience the peace that passes all understanding? It is that person that will be prepared with the gospel of peace in other words if you have not experienced the gospel of peace it's hard for you to go share the gospel of peace many of us say that pastor I'm not I'm not well trained I don't have Bible school training I need to have at least six months of apologetics it's a very strong word these days amen to all that but if you have experienced the love of Christ through the gospel you have everything you need to share the gospel. If you have truly experienced the love of Christ in your life, which is the message of the gospel, then you have everything to share the gospel. Because if gospel sharing was all about Bible school training, then it would take a long time. It wouldn't be just one verse, Great Commission. It there says, go share the gospel and then disciple them. That is part. But we focus so much on the training part, we never go anywhere. We are so trained. I was talking to one person very recently. I won't name the person. He says, we have come to a place where we are with a bunch of obese Christians. Because we've been eating, eating, eating for a long time. Feeding Sunday morning message, Wednesday evening message, Thursday morning message, Friday morning message. Then the time you have free time, YouTube message. Then the pastor of India message. The one from UK message. Then Australia message. Then again Saturday night, come back to church message. Man, how much did you eat last week? Ooh, a whole lot. What are you going to do with that? I don't know, I'm going to eat more next week. That's what pastor says. Prayerfully come and attend. Welcome to IPC restaurant. Because we ask, give a menu, and then we receive. We ministers and men of God stand in God's presence and receive and ask what needs to be delivered. We deliver. Not for just to be fed, but to be fed so we are equipped to deliver. You are called to deliver. How old are you? Eight. This is a missionary right here. Some of you are like, oh, hallelujah, pastor prophesied over him. When he finishes college, he's going to be a mighty warrior. Right now. What's your name? 
Aiden. Now, Aiden might be freaking out. I did not know I was called to be a missionary. Your life more than words. Aiden's life more than words. Your life should be your best gospel. That is why your shoe is preparation of the gospel of peace. Before even you say a word, everywhere you place your feet, your presence is Christ's presence in you. They will see something different in you. How will they know that? You got to have the truth first. You got to have righteousness over you. Oh, I'm not worthy to say the gospel. Who said you're worthy? You're made worthy through Christ Jesus. So stop justifying yourself by yourself. You're justified in Christ Jesus. And then you walk yourself. Okay, we got to go forward, right? You with me? Somebody say amen. amen. We're done with truth, righteousness, and the preparation of gospel of peace. Always say that together. It's one big shoe. It's not fit to your size. You fit to that size. Oh, that's another word right there. Did you get that? Did you get that? I got to write that down later. In addition to all, taking up the... Oh, some of you have been holding the shield for a while. I got the shield bash of faith. We even sang a song about faith. I didn't put See, we talk about increase of faith. The disciples once asked Jesus, increase of faith. And humorous, hilarious Jesus gave some other example. I don't have time to go there. You can go read that back later. I think it's in Luke 9. And then he talks about the story of 10 lepers. He never answers that question the way disciples want to answer the question. That's a whole different word. I, I don't want to get digressed too far. Increasing of faith is equal to obedience to Christ. Okay? Increase our faith is equal to obedience in Christ. The more you obey Christ, the more your faith will increase. The more you obey the word, the more your faith will increase. Faith is not about headache going away. We have limited Jesus to a small family medicine, family practitioner. Do you know that? The most difficult part of specialty for Jesus is oncology, by the way. Because oncology, you don't go to Jesus. You have lost all hope. Neurology, don't even mention. Jesus has no expertise in that department. Some of you are understanding what I'm trying to say. Diabetes, maybe. Headache, for sure. Jesus can do that. By the power of Tylenol and the work of ibuprofen, I speak the name of... I'm not saying those are wrong. I, uh, but we have limited what Jesus can do. That's where our faith stands. It's not that stop praying over cancer. And it's not about praying and seeing cancer being healed. That is not what defines your faith. The message of the gospel, it's not about I came to cure cancer. The message is I came to cure sinners. I'd rather go to heaven with, without one eye and with fourth stage cancer than go to hell healthy as ever, going to gym four times a week. Somebody get what I said? That's the shield of faith. My shield of faith is not my stories that God healed me when I was a kid. Some of you might know my parents. My dad, Pastor T. Verghese, my mom, Joyma Verghese. They may have come to this church well back, I don't know. God has done so many healings in my family, in my life as well. My mom was not supposed to live beyond the age of 16, 17, 18. As she grew up, the medical science did not define her to be a healthy mom. She would not have a healthy pregnancy. Long story short, this happened in Kuwait. I was born in Kuwait. Through that first pregnancy, when they found that she was carrying, they were very concerned. Through every appointment, she had much, so, much, uh, so much complications. High blood pressure, you name it. And at one point it came to a phase that they said, we got to get the baby out because she's not doing well. We either save the baby, she might not make it. Or we save her, the baby won't make it. So it was kind of premature, probably 37 weeks. In this day and age, you don't really call that a big deal. This is back in the day. And to save the mother, they decided to take the baby out. 
But there were a lot of people who were praying in faith. What was faith? Obeying and believing in what Christ was all about. Lord, if it's your will, you do a miracle. And for God's glory, God bless my parents with a healthy young boy. And because it was an answer to prayer, because they cried out and God blessed them with this miracle, they named me Samuel, Sam. But right from young age, when I was four months old, I was diagnosed with hernia. You can't tell a little girl, baby boy not to cry, not to insert pressure. Hernia is so hard when you insert pressure. But God healed me. I don't have time to go to all that story right now. With a man who never knew me, came to a meeting from Jordan and came back just to pray for me. I'm just going to stop it right there because to God be the glory. Did not go well. The next thing came out, one after another. I had asthma for two years. When I was four months old, my head was too big. The bones in my skull were deformed. So I was four month old body, but my head looked like a nine month old baby. Not hydrophallic, it was just a deformed skull. The doctor said that he may have some cognitive disabilities. The bones in my leg wouldn't grow properly. So the end sum of it all, cognitive difficulties, won't walk properly, pretty much a lump of flesh. This is not the answer to prayer. There's so much I can talk about how faith had to work because saying the word. It is in God's purpose that he had a plan and purpose over each one of our lives. I never went to kindergarten because I never talked properly. I had speech delay for almost five years. I pretty much said mama, dada, lala. And then after that I went to school, I used to get kicked out of class because I was talking too much. I used to tell the teacher, I have a lot to catch up, you know. God is still in the business of doing miracles, but I did not accept Christ because he healed me. I did it because I realized I was a sinner and the cross, Christ was the only way. That is the greatest miracle he did. So my shield of faith is not based off a whole lot of stories that I can say that would startle your eyes. The greatest thing should startle you is that you were destined, I was destined to hell, but he chose to board it on the cross. A father who did not spare his own son because he loved us so much, he gave his only begotten son that you and I were sinners. No matter what you washed yourself, you would always be a sinner. But when you wash yourself in the blood of Christ Jesus, that will make you whole. And that is what makes you who you are. That is the shield you hold strong in front of you. Hallelujah. Therefore stand firm Stand firm not based on your stories Stand firm not based on your Appuch and Amachi's experiences Don't base your Christian life Because Stotram we are coming to a generation that does not understand Apach and Namachis who they are. We tell them the story, but they see that Apach and through you. They see that Amachis sacrifice through you. So if you are not living that life, that would be just a fairy tale to talk about I'm a fourth generation, fifth generation Christian. It is good to say Christian human tradition legacy. I'm a fifth generation, third generation. But in your spiritual life, you are first generation because there's only sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. There is no grandson. There's no granddaughter. There's no great granddaughter. There's only sons and daughters. Somebody say amen. That is what should change your experience. Praise God for the ones who, the trailblazers. But I appreciate and see Christ through them. And therefore I have my own experience with Christ. That's what makes you and you and you a missionary. Because you don't walk with your faith that your dad and mom taught you. You understand your heart that I need to believe in this Jesus. I live in a very crazy world. Even people who have been returning, writing worship songs and been preaching are now walking away from their faith. It was a very tough season that I had to preach a message in my church. Of the importance of understanding your faith. Faith is not based on a bunch of celebrities and people out there. Faith is Christ Jesus. I praise God for this man of God for the legacy that he has invested you. But you should not be a member of church because he is the pastor. You should be a member of church because I am called to be part of a body of Christ. Your faith should be rooted not because your Sunday morning experience. It's your daily experience that defines your faith. Hallelujah. So you don't pick up your shield one day a week. You pick up your shield every day of your life. 
the battle is real church Monday through Sunday Saturday Wednesday when it's high when it's low when it's hump day when it's the beginning day when it's end of the day when it's TGIF every single day you have the shield right in front of you hallelujah thank you Jesus because this is what helps you extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one your faith what did I say the faith is equal to obedience in Christ the truth is so important if you don't based on this on a truth that you feed yourself more than more than reading commentaries more than reading articles more than reading other definitions you read the word God did not design this word so you can understand this with based on commentaries and other preachings. God designed this word so he can reveal himself to you in a personal way along with the help of everything others. So God did not design this word so you will understand this after one year retreat. God designed this word so you will understand it every day of your life. You could go back and read the same passage Ephesians 6 and God will reveal something new to you. Something that applies in your life that I don't know because he knows. And when you apply that, that is what helps you stand in the truth and righteousness and preparation of the gospel. That's why I have faith. So if my life story is all about me writing a book or say that was amazing testimony Pastor Sam if you don't see Christ through my testimony woe unto me that is why I did not start off my preaching with the testimony I want you to see Christ Christ is still in the business of healing speech delayed he can heal you I am an evidence Hernia, he can heal. I'm an evidence. Cognitive disabilities, he can heal. I'm an evidence. But I am also an evidence to say that I was once a sinner, but Christ saved me so I can make it to eternity. Hallelujah. So that is the shield I can come against devil when he comes to fight me. Pastor, good job, great message. But in my alone Christian walk, when the devil brings those fiery arrows against me, what I raise up is the band, the shield of faith that I have in Christ Jesus. God is not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, power, and discipline, sound mind. Hallelujah. God is speaking. Amen. Verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation. Oh, I thought salvation would be number one. Paul, I thought you got the order wrong. I thought you would put it up on the first part. Put your helmet right before you start driving. <laughs> one who learned and knows the truth is the one who should put the helmet on. If my eight-year-old, soon-to-be nine-year-old puts on my helmet, that's not going to mean anything for her. I'll say that again. My helmet is designed for my head. Your helmet of salvation, that you know your past, you know your life, and you know the Christ that changed your life, and that is what covers your head, your mind, your thoughts. All of you are thinking. There's a book by Joyce Meyer, The Battlefield of the Mind. That is the first place everything happens before it comes out. Some people have no filter. Whatever happens here comes out through here. But some of them we filter it so well, we never take it out. What we fantasize in our head after looking at somebody, nobody sees that, only God. You cover your head with salvation. Understand who you are, your identity. Cover your mind, all those thoughts. How do you do that? First go back to the truth. You have been walking with that old helmet. When did you get saved? 54 years ago. When did you get saved? 16 years ago. When did you get saved? 6 years ago. Did you know your head grew after that? Your Christian life grew after that? Your exposure to flesh grew after that? 
when I did this illustration once, I took my child's bicycle helmet and tried to put it on my head. It wouldn't fit. Why? My understanding of salvation is 15 years ago. We are justified, we are sanctified, and we are glorified. The helmet of salvation goes through all those three phases. You don't just wear on just once you're justified. Great, that is the truth. But you apply that in your daily life. You cover your mind, your thoughts. What are you exposing yourself? What are you feeding yourself? What you feed will determine where you will get to. In other words, somebody said, I think it's A.W. Torsor said, what you feed will determine your destiny. What are you feeding yourself? Spiritually and physically too. That will determine where you will end. What are you feeding yourself? How much of a word are you feeding yourself? You know, somebody recently, we were having a talk on relationship and dating and marriage and all that stuff. And one question came, it was all anonymous. And they were asking, we had a panel and I was one of them in our church. And they asked, Pastor, how long do you date to know that is the right one? This is a man who knows very well. Very well in the sense, 25 years ago, I posted on Facebook. I was not kidding. I still have the notes that I used that to help youngsters this age. What he invested me 25 some years ago. So therefore, what is invested in you, utilize it not to be obese, Christian. You get it, get it out. Okay, that was a different topic. You with me? So they were asking how long. So you're so concerned of how long you spend with one person to figure out if there's a right one. I asked, how long do you spend with this person to figure out this is the right one? This will determine how long you want to spend with that person to figure out if that person is the right one. I didn't say not to spend time. I didn't say not to go figure out how long and figure out. But try this method first. If you want to spend six months with that person, average the time you spend. You want to spend at least one hour, either over the phone or text or hang out with that person, girl or boy. I'm not saying you should, you should not. Don't. I'm trying to get to a point. If you want one hour, every single day, whether over the phone or text, I know you guys do more than an hour. Everybody say, I know nobody will say amen right now. <laughs> Seven hours a week. Cut it down to five. I'll give you a discount. I give you a good price. One week, five. Six months, the least. Six times four, 24. 24 times 5, 120 hours. So in a span of whole six months, the least you may want to spend, according to your calculation, is 120 hours to get to know this person. Six months, did you spend 120 hours in the Word? Simple challenge. I'm not saying too much fasting and prayer. In six months, did you spend 120 hours in the Word? That is the average less than one hour a day. That will determine how much long you need to spend with somebody. Because this is your first love. This is the first person you should have a relationship with. This is the first person you have to have an encounter with. This is the first person that should teach you what love is all about. This is the first person that should teach you what your destiny is all about. Hallelujah. Take the helmet of salvation. And then the sword of spirit, which is the. the the Satting on a murky vacanitra pada, you no murkam pada, Pandangan on the murky vacha porerno vene. Mala leto easy. Sorry, I had to use a little bit of Malayalam too. It's easy for us to swore. It's easy for us to play that video game with the attack A, B, A, B, shoot, 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 Fortnite. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm not a big fan of Call of Duty. 
I was not planning to go that route. There's a bigger call of duty you have on your life. Ooh, that's preach. Someone say that, amen, bro. Come on. The cross, the story of Calvary is the best Assassin's Creed, man. Okay, okay, I got, yes, yeah, I'm, I'm spiritualizing everything too much. I'm just trying to get your attention. It's getting close to now. I saw some of you yawning. I had to do something to get you back. It worked. You're so quick into fire mode, but it takes so much to prepare who you are. The first thing you do in a video game is choose the warrior. The second thing you do is choose the accessory, what you want them to do. And the third thing is to start the game. Hit start. And the fourth thing is you recognize who your enemy is and then they move. You don't just stand there. Some of like how I do. Because I don't know all the buttons, man. I just get confused. I just got to shoot, 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 shoot. You're done. You're done. Empty, E, empty, go. That's how some of our Christian life is. First, choose who you are. Know who you are as a warrior. Choose your accessories, your helmet, your belt before your sword. God has given you authority. You know your authority. I got to wrap up. The word is just coming up tonight, Pastor. Ooh, 57. Then I got to get the last point. This is the most important part in the whole spiritual armor. Standing firm, therefore standing firm, knowing your battles, standing firm, what you need to do, truth, gird your loins, righteousness, your breastplate, the preparation of the gospel of peace, which is a shoe, you walk forward, you move forward, you need to understand the power of the gospel. Fourth, the helmet of salvation, no, the shield of faith. Fifth, the helmet of salvation. Sixth, the word all this covered in one big shield which is called which is called uh -uh. which is called I did not say this what's the next verse verse 19 see so go back to the word go back to the truth huh pray also that's what I'm gonna wrap tonight with all this is wrapped up. All this is fueled, refueled. All this is rebuilt. All this is made firm in prayer. Build your prayer life. If I said 120 hours of just spending time with God, try that out. Go change your prayer life. It will change your life. I don't want anybody to feel guilty here. I don't want you to, oh, I made that decision last time. It never worked out. Spirit of God is not a spirit of condemnation. It's a spirit of conviction. So if you feel convicted, make a change. If this retreat is about you changing your lifestyle, that's what it's all about. If you want to stand firm, stand firm with what you need, not the way you wanted to qualify. This is the formula he gives. You confine yourself to the formula instead of asking him to confine with you. Lord, give me a new understanding of what truth is. Help me to follow truth. Help me to walk in this truth. Help me to cover myself in the truth and righteousness is what Christ is all about. Help me to walk in an old school, Sunday school teaching that I learned. Help me to experience salvation. Help me to understand and cover my minds, my thoughts, what I work in a daily manner, what happens in my head, things that I need to get away from my life. Help me to flee from it. Things that I've fed and entertained in my life. If I need to get away from that, get away from this. If it's some relationship or things that you have been building for a while, get away from that. You might be hurting somebody. It's okay to hurt somebody. It's not okay to hurt God. I'd rather please God if I have to hurt somebody because I want to do His will, not my lover's will. Walk in His will. Transform yourself and cover all this in prayer. Tonight when you go back to your beds, when everything is done and deal, I pray that you will spend some time. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, before you come with breakfast, before you get ready for the morning devotion and us going, hanging out with fellowship time, I pray that you will take a few minutes in prayer, understanding what you just heard. Lord, I want my life to change. Not just I want to pray the same change. Change me, O God. Change me, O God. He has done everything what you need to change. I just need to apply and submit myself to that change. That's what David said. After the greatest man of the God's own heart, when he made the greatest mistake 
make ever in his life he came back to the greatest place he could come that was before Yahweh and he said a simple prayer Psalm 51 create in me a clean heart of God renew a right spirit within me cast me not away from your presence I want to be there it's not that you left I left your presence I keep complaining God where are you you have always been there the shalom has always been there in my boat I am the one who has been applying my own knowledge trying to calm the storm but I have run away so far from you I need to come back to the father's house renew or rise cast me not away from your presence take not your Holy Spirit from me there is nothing wrong with the Holy Spirit you have been questioning the Holy Spirit you have been confused by the Holy Spirit you have been asking doubts about the Holy Spirit he is real he is not a thing he is the third person that is real standing right next to you take not the Holy Spirit from me restore unto me the joy of salvation I was once saved I once enjoyed the joy of the Lord but I have ran away from that come help me to come back to the father's house help me not to to just to walk in a spirit of guilt and saying that my father will not love me you do not know how wrong I have been come back he loves you so much you have done it the 80th time he still stands there with a graceful hand asking I will lift you up restore unto me the joy of salvation and renew a right spirit within me can we close our eyes for a moment and respond to God's word this evening Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Tonight I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hands or anything of that manner. We are all in here for retreat, including myself. This applies to all of us. If there's anyone that is here as a child of God, the spiritual armor applies to you. If there's anyone here as a child of God, standing firm applies to all of us. And therefore let's submit all of us before the word that we heard today. Father, we once again commit this time in your hands. Thank you for preparing this moment that you brought us from different places, different homes, different background, different circumstances, different lifestyle, different life story and journeys that only you know that some of us meet each other maybe once a week and we do not know what happens in our lives but we have come together to a God that knows the inner cry of our heart as one whole body of Christ this evening. We come together. Give us a renewed mindset in standing firm, not based on some old experience but something new new and tangible these days that we will be transformed by the power of God that Holy Spirit you will work in our hearts Lord Jesus thank you for what you spoke to us continue to help us to walk in the spirit walk in the land of the living knowing what you have called us for thank you for the battle belongs to the Lord thank you for helping us to identify who are we battling and help us to be prepared in our daily journey because we are called by you Lord Jesus we thank you give us your grace and peace in Jesus name we pray Amen. Hallelujah.